morning and welcome to La Sentinelle. We have the pleasure to have uh, Stan Tamkivi from Estonia, the CEO of Telport NIC with us this morning. Prior to co-founding Telport, Stan served at Skype Estonia as an early executive and an advisor on matters related to information technology, innovation and entrepreneurship to the President of the Republic of Estonia. Also with us today, Suraj Ramgulam, project manager from the Ministry of Technology, Communication and Innovation, Denis Lacour from Esokia Web Agency Limited, Donald Limfat, director at Information Management Services Limited, Vivek Matur, CEO at the Cloud Factory EMEA, Ish Sukan from Mauritius Internet Users, and my co-host, Subramanian Munisami, member of Mauritius Internet Users. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Good morning. The term startup has been a buzzword for quite some time now, and as with all buzzwords, the term is often overused and misused. Stan, you founded the first digital media agency in Estonia at the age of 18. Could you explain what a startup is all about? I think these days, startup, the word startup mostly refers to any early stage tech company and why tech companies that basically comes from the fact that when you build technology, then there is a high likelihood that if it works, it will scale up very, very quickly. So the startups are sort of early companies intending to scale. And uh, beyond that, there is one specific definition of the word startup that, uh, that the guy called Steve Blank in California uh, has been uh, preaching, which I personally like very much, which is that the startup is a group of people who have gotten together or started working together in order to find a repeatable business model behind an idea that they have. So that definition even implies that startup is something that happens before it becomes a company. So it's very, very early stage, very risky. Um, and uh, if it works, it's extremely potent. Uh, if it doesn't work, 90% of the startups fail. So, so that's the pre-company. So could you share your experience with us? Because you started at the age of 18. It's, quite, it's a very young age, actually, to start a startup. Yeah, I started my first company when I was uh, out of high school um, and uh, in parallel to going to university. And a few years later, the company was kind of working, so I had to drop out of college. And the typical entrepreneurial story you hear from uh, many corners of the world. And, and since then, I've been uh, building companies, helping people to start companies or helping them to grow them um, uh, ever since. And what's so fascinating about startups for me is the fact that uh, nothing really exists. It's, it's you, you wake up in the morning, you go to the office or go to your bedroom and open your computer and there is nothing there. And when you finish your work, there is a company that is giving work to people or providing services to the users or, or something beautiful has happened. And that's a, like a magical feeling of creating something out of nothing that I always crave. Um, there are some other aspects. Before organizations grow large, um, they tend to be very nimble, very agile, very fast moving. Uh, anything you want to do, you can do today. Anybody you want to work with, you can just convince you to join you. There is no hierarchy, there is no process yet. Uh, there is no bureaucracy to, to slow things down and, and that can be extremely empowering. It can be very tiresome as well. How about funding? Uh, Startup funding, I think, over the last 30, 40 years in the world um, has been formalizing a bit. So it used to be more random. Now you see much more of a tiered structure. Um, and, and most of that language and most of that structure has been born in Silicon Valley on the west coast of the U US. But now it's become more natural in other startup hubs. And how it typically works is that in the beginning, uh, usually the first round of capital you can usually attract is called triple F. Friends, family, and fools. So people who, who, who are willing to give money for something extremely risky that doesn't exist yet. Uh, when you get more formal, there are groups of people called business angels or angel investors uh, who are uh, willing to invest a small amount in many different startups, hoping that when across the portfolio, if something works, they will make their money back. And usually when you look at the angels around the world, they are people who have built their own companies before or have become investors before. So they are sort of uh, paying it forward for the next generations of helping them to start the companies. Uh, the next step from that, a bit more formal, are seed funds, which are companies or funds that are pooling together investor money to put it into early stage companies. And from there on, you will be looking at venture capital funds, which are m today we're talking to the largest 
VC funds in the world manage billions and billions of dollars and they attract capital from large university endowments and governments and sovereign funds and pension funds and it looks very much like a Wall Street investor firm but it's focused on uh, early stage tech companies. And so it goes late, uh, later and later and if a startup has proven their business model and they've become already successful in their business, then they can plan for an IPO or go public and raise capital from the public markets. So that's a long cycle. For many companies, they will die in the early stages and never get to the last ones. For the rare few that, that do, that there is a sequence of several, many, many funding events that you have to go through, uh, maybe across 10, even 15 years in order to really come out on the top. What are the risks involved? Uh, basically, day one of a startup, it's only risks. There's nothing else. And, and the life of an entrepreneur is just walk, working through every day and removing some of the risks. In the beginning, you try to attract the best people. You need to raise the capital. You need to find the users. You need to be able to convince them to come and, and use your product. Uh, the, the organizational risk, the people risk, the market risk, all these risks. Um, so, so if a company comes out on the other end, it, they, the founders and the early employees have succeeded to, to remove some of those risks. Uh, but uh, many of those don't. And so, so that's maybe another a bit um, counterintuitive thing about startups is, is you have to be okay with failure. Like failure is all over that landscape. And if most people don't fail, a few won't succeed. And that's something that is a bit hard to grasp for, for bystanders, for example. And who can actually create a start startup? Startup is just a, a one of the vehicles how people can influence the world. Like you can go and get elected to the government. You can go and start a nonprofit. You can go and, um, I don't know, uh, start working with the neighborhood kids and, and teach them something and influence the world. Startup is just one of those vehicles how you can do that. Uh, speaking specifically about technology, of course, uh, it helps if you know technology. <laughs> so, so, uh, so most of the successful founders, they have some sort of real sciences background. They've studied math and physics well at school. Um, they they, they uh, have some talent of uh, selling, uh, usually because early st stage startups are a lot about selling, selling your ideas, selling the concept to early employees, selling to your users. So they, they are usually able to convince others to join, join their mission. Um, and um, uh, the other thing is that I personally like and appreciate startup teams that are more than one person. Mm -hmm. Usually it takes several skill sets to make a startup happen. And so you need some engineers, you need some, uh, some designers, you need some business people, uh, you need these different competences to come together and, uh, and that's why m very often you see two or three co-founders of a startup rather than just one person starting. In Estonia, how many startups do we have at the moment? Uh, these days, it was recently counted that we have uh, 400 active tech startups. And Estonia is the size of Mauritius, which, is, which is, uh, extremely makes it extremely fun to have this conversation here. And the Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, is the size of Port Louis, roughly. So, so uh, in that scene, uh, the the thing that kick-started the Estonian startup scene uh, was the success of Skype. So Skype was founded by a Swede and Dane and four Estonian software engineers. So it was a very international team. And the first office, the R&D center of, of Skype started in Estonia. And even today, it's a 500 person engineering organization there, now belonging to Microsoft. From that story, that sort of kick-started a wave of tech startups for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, the um, young Estonian engineers saw that they don't have to leave their home country to build something global. You can sit in Tallinn, Estonia and build a product that attracts 400,000 people a day. And that's a very powerful feeling. Secondly, uh, that Skype business card gives a lot of credibility and opens a lot of doors for many people uh, around the world. You can approach investors, you can approach uh, other engineers and people have no, your known quantity now. And thirdly, uh, after the success of Skype, and Skype was uh, exited to eBay for $2.6 billion and $8.5 billion to Microsoft later, that left a little bit of capital behind also in Estonia. And, and because of that, people either have money or they know people who have money when they want to start a new business. So out of those 400 startups now, uh, a significant share have either ex-Skype founders, ex-Skype advisors, ex-Skype angel investors or something related to Skype um, that uh, I think has made it more vibrant than it would normally have developed. 
So how is it that in 10 years Estonia managed to become an ICT powerhouse actually? Yeah, I think that's, that's uh, partially the, the Skype effect that I was talking about that has kick-started the startup side. In parallel, I think Estonia has been pretty good with, uh, with the public side of technology use. Um, and uh, the roots of that go back a bit more than 10 years. Uh, Estonia regained independence from the Soviet occupation in 91, which if you look at the calendar, it coincides with 93 when graphical web browsing came along. So all of a sudden you have a completely reset country. Under Soviet rule, entrepreneurship was a criminal offense. And now the next day, uh, there's a blank playing field and anybody can do anything. And at the same time, internet technologies just come in. So if you combine those, you get the very, very, very sort of a interesting result as we've seen. And some of those concepts that the world is just coming around to right now, like parliamentary elections online or digital signature everywhere, or, or I don't know, even mobile parking and stuff like that. Uh, the digital signature law was passed in 2001 in Estonia. So we, we've had that for 15 years and now we're getting to a point where Estonia is looking at all, all the systems that we built and okay, what can we open up to the world because we already know how to build and use those things. So Estonia is now handing out e-residency to other people who want to use Estonian government systems even if they are not in Estonia. And so this private and public sides together, I think ha have created this, this uh, a pretty nice environment where to build new companies. Last September, a delegation from Mauritius was actually in Estonia. They were very impressed, I could say, especially the Minister of ICT. Um, do you think that Mauritius has the potential to eventually become like Estonia? Absolutely. I'm, there are a few things. Um, first of all, the company that I'm building right now, it's called Teleport. And, and what we do is we help to, uh, people to find the best place to live and work for whatever they do. And today we have data about 120 cities around the world and we, by cities, like in, in that sense, urban areas or Mauritius would be a good example of an urban area where people can operate. While gathering that data and looking at these this, this differences of these hubs, I'm even more convinced than before that in our lifetime we will see a much more diversified, much more spread out picture of innovation around the world. There will be many, many more smaller hubs specializing in something and being really great in something. It won't be like 10 years ago, you could hear European entrepreneurs uh, ask, should we go to Silicon Valley or not? Like, should I move or should I not? It's a binary question. These days, we, we're not hearing that anymore. It's, it's more about, okay, how much time should I spend in Silicon Valley? And should I go to London as well? And maybe I should put some engineering in Mauritius and maybe I should do something in Ukraine. And people are thinking much more widely about their location and what makes sense where. And the one single hub will not solve it for the world. Th there is a lot of activity in the US. There is a lot of activity in China. There's a few s larger cities in, in the Europe that will take a lot of activity. But I believe there will be a much longer tail uh, of places where innovation will happen. And the other thing I would like to highlight is something that uh, very often with Estonia, the, the, uh, uh, the comment has been that or be people view at small size almost as a deficiency. And actually, I think they're missing a very important point. Small companies, small startups, small societies, small cities, small countries are actually ex have an extreme benefit of being very, very fast if they want to. And because of that, in smaller places, um, something that, that you would take 10 years to push through as a law in Germany or, or s funding a pan-Indian startup movement, imagine the amount of capital needed. If you do those things in small places like Estonia or Mauritius, they can happen very, very quickly. So I think these, what you see today is n in no means a predictor of what's going to be here in five years. One or two teams building something great can change the entire landscape very quickly. A memorandum of understanding in the area of e-governance has been signed by the Ministry of Technology, uh, Communication and Innovation with the Government of Estonia. How can Mauritius benefit from Estonia? I was very glad to hear that that's already in place, even before I came to a vacation in Mauritius. Um, it's um, probably the biggest thing to look at um, is that it's not just about technology. Uh, making an e-government work needs several things, several stars to align at the same time. So it's, it's the technology for sure, you need to have that in place. It's explaining and pulling along people uh, to use those technologies and it's always easier with the younger people but Estonia did quite a lot to also educate the older people for example to come along. Uh, 
also some of the things that have failed in some countries worked in Estonia because we made them mandatory, like ID cards. Uh, we gave mandatory ID cards to everybody turning 15 and they had two certificates for digital signing and authentication. And most people at the time didn't know what to do with them, but five years later now you can know you can build systems because everybody has them. So that sort of things. Also the legal frameworks, just uh, a great law that I, I love uh, in Estonia is, is that the, the digital signature law says that no government official can ever refuse a digitally signed document which means that immediately nobody who just doesn't want to learn technology can say that, hey, you have to bring it on paper. They have to accept if you send it digitally. And all of a sudden that forces people to build new systems to make this handling easier. And sort of these little, little quirks outside of technology, I think, are, are things to pay attention to. There is also the question of security on the Internet. Um, how did Estonia convince the population that there wouldn't be any data breach? Well, there is no single system on this planet that is ultimately secure. Like the only secure computer is the one locked down in basement, uh, detached from from electricity, and uh, by no means connected to internet. So, uh, in that sense, it's more about risk management. And uh, some of the things that Estonia has put in place, for example, uh, about data privacy. A good example is that, as an Estonian citizen, um, yes, the police can go and check on my records, but I can go online and see who accessed it and when. So if I see an official coming and checking my details and they ha have no reason, I can actually go back and either, either file a complaint or sue them or whatnot. And people have been fired from uh, official roles who have tried to access, I don't know, the data of the neighbors or whatnot. So you can, uh, from one side, you can do what you can with encryption and, and privacy protection by technological means, but you can also build systems that give people more confidence that they have uh, more control over how their data works. Or with, with internet voting, um, you can vote online, you can re-vote. So if somebody puts a gun to your head and forces you to vote some other way, you can go and vote an hour later and, and, cost and your last vote counts. And if you're still in some situation where you don't feel that your, your privacy is respected or somebody's looking over your shoulder, you can still go and vote the old style on the election day. So you can build this sort of backup measures in.